um, by not only discussing facts and figures. Um, first of all, we are going to focus on the human dimension of energy poverty to realize that it affects very specific people, very specific families. It's a very diverse group, and we are going to talk about them in part one. Later, we are going to present a presentation um, commissioned um, by uh, Polish Green Network. We have researchers from the network with us. Um, who have conducted this qualitative studies. Um, they conducted interviews with officials, um, with representatives of different players of this system um, who get in touch with people affected by energy poverty. Later, we will discuss how the country is coping or is not coping with energy poverty. Um, it's important because it's a very unusual moment in time, the EU um, has defined um, even more ambitious climate goals. Um, we By 2050, we want to be, um, we want to emit no emissions. So um, we will discuss outcomes, costs paid by people who have been affected by energy poverty, people who will have to um, pay the biggest price to achieve net zero. Um, Europe is allocating massive funds to improve um, the energy efficiency of buildings and consequences are being mitigated. Um, a new measure, the Social Climate Fund, is about to be launched. So today um, we want to discuss how important it is, what opportunities, what challenges it is posing, no matter which organizations or institutions we are representing. I want you to feel that we need to act and be very active in this area. So can we start? Okay, so instead of giving you facts and figures on energy poverty, I would like to um, play um, footage that was recorded during a series of debates on energy poverty. Um, this process was initiated by Stocznia Foundation. We were discussing the cost of energy efficiency, um, the toll taken by energy efficiency. Um, those discussions um, were very ed educational. And later, a list of 100 recommendations was created on how to cope with energy poverty. But more about it, because we have with us today representative of Stocznia Foundation um, who organized this panel. Okay, so um, there are subtitles that go with the video. Um, okay, so if you want to hear me, I will try to um, describe what is happening on the video. Okay, so if um, we can have a go with the movie now.
Przepraszam, rozumiem, że tutaj nie będzie widać tego filmu w ogóle. <laughs> Widzicie Państwo, jak właśnie... Okay, as you can see, um, technical hiccups, um, not with energy, um, but with other technologies are taking a toll on our daily life. I comprehended for the first time what energy poverty is when I was reading reading a report of the food bank. Someone said um, something that is very telling. I'm more afraid of hunger than cold. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm more afraid of cold than hunger. Energy poverty um, is a phenomenon related to the cost of energy. When a household has a small budget and little income, and most of it is spent on electricity, on heating, it's a problem which is affecting 10% of the Polish society. This means that more than one million families in Poland cannot afford to have their homes heated. I can only heat my home for a brief period of time. Very often, people need to decide whether they are going to buy food, medicine, or spend the money on heating, so that means that some needs remain unsatisfied. It's not a trend uh, which corresponds to poverty as we know it. Um, very often those families have an income higher than the lowest income, but Nevertheless, it is insufficient to pay heating bills. The most traumatic situation is when one has to ask himself or herself, will I spend it on food or will I spend it on heating? Living in a home which is insufficiently heated has very serious health consequences. You will get a cold. Um, you will have problems with your hormones. Um, you can have mental issues. Um, you, you can also suffer of other conditions. So you will have to spend more money on healthcare. And this triggers other problems and the situation may spiral out of control. There are regions in Poland which are mainly affected by energy poverty. In some regions, 10% of families have insufficient income to cover heating bills. It mainly affects residents of the countryside and small towns. Most people who are affected by energy poverty live in detached homes built in the 1940s until 1960s. Very often these are senior citizens who live on their own because their family has moved out. Homes they live in are far too big for them. And they are usually heated with, with coal furnaces or other heat sources um, fueled with gas or electricity. In large cities, people who struggle with paying energy bills are mainly senior citizens who live on their own. They usually live in 
tenement houses or buildings with are not connected to the central heating system and they are forced to use individual heating sources usually fueled by electric energy or coal there are three reasons behind energy poverty first of all low income secondly high energy bills and third low energy efficiency People who are most prone and exposed to energy poverty are pensioners, um, people with disabilities, people with no permanent employment or so source of income. Well, situations like this do happen in Poland. Sometimes you can earn quite good money, uh, income which is above average, but you are living in an old home which has not been insulated and you cannot really afford to cover your heating bills. You have no thermal comfort. Buildings in Poland have very low energy efficiency standards. 60% of buildings have not been insulated. They are fitted with old, um, not very tight windows. Um, they are heated with old, ineffective and high emission heat sources. It may be the case that a household um, has is fitted with equipment which is very energy consuming and old, such as old washing machines, TV sets, um, cooking ranges, which use a lot of electricity. If prices of heating or electric energy are going up, but income of average citizens isn't, the problem is growing. Energy efficiency um, is important as energy poverty is affecting 10% of Polish households and everyone is paying its price. Well, first of all, um, it's air pollution. It's very often the case that people who have fallen victims to energy poverty are living in cold homes um, they are frail and not very healthy and they have no choice. Um, they also have very high carbon footprint. So health issues are the second consequence. Uh, respiratory system diseases are very common um, and they are even more widespread today. Um, they trigger heart conditions, um, cancer, what is generating very high bills in the healthcare system. People who are living below minimum standards, um, who have very low quality of life, um, are affected by energy poverty. Very often their homes are cold and damp. Um, you can't really work there. You can't use the computer or all essential um, modern amenities that should be accessible. Um, it is right for everyone to enjoy modern comforts. Okay, so I hope that you've managed to hear something. So right now, um, we are talking about the human face of energy poverty, and this is what we are going to discuss with our panelists. I'm going to introduce them now. Um, so, um, Maria Belina Brzozowska of Shipyard Foundation, um, a person um, who helped to organize debates about the cost of energy and Europe's first civic panel dedicated to energy poverty. 
I would like to invite um, Director um, of Bielany Center for Social Services, Agnieszka Filipowicz. Alicja Piekarz of the Polish uh, Green Network, one of the researchers who conducted the study into energy poverty. I would like to invite Jacek Kisiel, um, Deputy Director of the Department for the Quality of Air at Warsaw Municipal Office and Professor Richard Scharfenberg, um, the president of um, European Anti-Poverty Network Poland, and Bessie Nebiu, director um, from Habitat for Humanity International. Okay, so um, in this lineup, we are going to discuss the human face of energy poverty. Um, how in your day-to-day -day work um, you meet people um, affected by energy poverty, but before we discuss very specific situations from day-to-day -day life, I would like to ask um, Richard Scherfenberg, um, who has been researching energy poverty and poverty in all its dimensions. Please tell us when we've started focusing on energy poverty as a separate trend. Um, um, what is the timeline of this trend? Please comment briefly. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And it's true that energy poverty um, for a long time um, um, has been discussed in Poland, has been researched in Poland. Um, the Institute for Structural Research has the biggest credit. And there are also organizations supporting sustainable development, which are researching it. Um, it was fairly a new topic for us. Um, because uh, within um, poverty, in a wide sense, we are mainly interested in low income. Um, so if uh, spending is too high compared to a norm, um, it wasn't relevant because, for example, we have minimum existence, social existence, which is the reference point for all spending. So one could conclude that um, focusing on specific spendings um, um, would be a part um, of research into energy poverty. For example, the portion of income spent on food. Recently, we've read a report about it. Um, malnutrition and hunger in Poland. So um, this area um, has been less investigated than energy poverty. Um, but if you are spending less on food, that means that you are focusing um, on different types of poverty. Okay, so what sprang to my mind and um, will be published in 2023 Poverty Watch that will be launched on the 30th of October is homelessness. In case of homelessness, the role of energy poverty is unclear because those people are not paying energy bills. And, you know, how they um, increase temperature, that's more complex. Um, but um, in case of people who are homeless, we are talking about NGOs and energy bills they are paying. Um, and like I've said, energy efficiency, um, I think back in 2008, we've had pioneer research 
into um, energy efficiency, what has not led um, to a, a publication. We didn't have a yearbook published at the time that would analyze all data on energy poverty. Um, that perhaps lies in front of us. Statistics Poland is um, publishing data on energy, not poverty. So um, this is clearly separated. Um, it conducts research into Polish households and investigates poverty um, in terms of spending, consumption, but is not pro preoccupied with um, issues related to energy. And um, energy-related research um, probably does not focus really on energy poverty. So it's a major challenge to combine those two areas. We are focused on poverty, on low income. Um, other researchers are focused on climate issues, on energy issues, which are, you know, big topics. Um, but um, combination of those two fields requires a lot of focus, attention. You need to nurture um, studies. And you, you need to make sure that circles which are um, researching um, green economy, climate, uh, and those who are specializing in poverty see the link. Um, I represent the camp which is preoccupied with poverty. So in Poverty Watch, there will be a separate item dedicated to energy poverty. So um, yes, we are aware of how important it is and we are going to focus on it um, in addition to malnutrition, hunger, and um, different groups which are vulnerable to poverty. Um, so legislation um, has um, adopted an official definition of energy poverty. Um, it was a breakthrough in energy law, um, um, although, you know, it is a complex issue which ministry is accountable for what um what indicates that um ministries um should see um energy poverty as a combined trend research wise both Eurostat, um, it's not very easy. When you um, go to Eurostat's website, um, you cannot really analyze energy poverty in all its dimensions. So high spending, low income versus the standard um, low energy efficiency of buildings. Um, such research may be conducted, but it is limited to households that um, declare that um, they are not able to adequately heat their homes. And you can look up households um, which are split um, which are poor or unprivileged. I've seen analysis which indicate which households um, are most vulnerable um, to heating deprivation. Uh, so from 2012 until 2022, most vulnerable in um, were households um, of single parents. Um, the Institute for Structural Studies conducted research which is focused on households, um, households that had a main source of income. And findings indicate um, that um, households whose source of income is um, not a job, so the retired, the disabled, um, are also most exposed to um, heating deprivation. So this is something you won't find in Eurostat's research. So, um, so Eurostat's got um, a long way to go in this respect because we have a well-defined um, term um, 
energy poverty in Poland and statistics Poland. The team which is investigating household budgets should um, put more focus on energy poverty. So, uh... Thank you very much. The professor has already started talking about systemic issues. We cannot escape that efficient uh, way to approach this complex topic of energy poverty requires actions from uh, state institutions. But let me not uh, discuss the results of our study yet. Agnieszka Filipowicz, uh, you as uh, social uh, security services, the institution that faces the most difficult situations and people who are worst off, the most vulnerable people. What is uh, your experience with regard to uh, contact with uh, people and social poverty, uh, energy poverty? Uh, is the problem visible? What do uh, your clients come to you with? Uh, I'm talking about the human dimension, not the systemic one. What is the situation on the front line? Right, thank you very much for the invitation to this meeting. Indeed, social uh, assistance centers is uh, the front line for granting aid. We are associated with financial transfers, and that's important, but it's also uh, where education happens. In our daily work of social workers in Warsaw, for quite a long time, we have uh, a model that divides uh, or separates uh, social work with uh, administrative uh, procedures. Procedures meaning money, any benefits. And social work is uh, about raising awareness, teaching people to live anew. People who are in a very difficult situation where they need support. When we're going to an interview as social workers, we can uh, do a provisional assessment of whether a given family, a given environment is in a crisis of poverty. That's step number one. That's the basis of the work of a social worker in a social security center. When we're going to visit an apartment, I'm talking about uh, a big agglomeration, Warsaw, the situation is slightly uh, different elsewhere in rural areas or small towns, but energy poverty affects people who live in uh, cities like Warsaw. So when a social worker goes to an apartment, they look at the windows, the windows which have not been replaced. They look at uh, the white goods, the equipment that is in the apartment, whether they are new, energy efficient or not. Usually, the, the equipment will be uh, very energy intensive. They go into an apartment. It's uh, midday and lights are on across this flat. These are all micro uh, bits, but uh, they are testament to the fact that uh, there is low awareness of energy issues among the inhabitants of uh, uh, this apartment. So all this contributes to uh, higher energy costs, and thus we need to transfer more money to such people. We will not give up on financial transfers. That's, you can be sure of, because the general economic situation will require even more uh, transfer of uh, funds to help uh, the most vulnerable groups. So that's Education. We also have a group of senior citizens in Bielany. Uh, um, we have one third of the population of the district of Bielany uh, in Warsaw. Uh, so the uh, Social Security uh, Center in Bielany uh, runs uh, uh, 
branch uh, centers where senior citizens uh, can come and they are educated there. We talk to these people that if in an apartment uh, you lower the temperature by two degrees, nothing bad's going to happen. We have to make senior citizens aware that uh, temperatures uh, that are below 30 degrees are optimum for them. Uh, all the people tend to heat, overheat their apartments. Senior citizens uh, often uh, say, but when they come to the social security center, that uh, they feel cold when they come. Uh, that the uh, senior citizens complain of, of uh, feeling cold, but we tell them just wear a jumper. Uh, and the professor also mentioned is that uh, there is the problem of uh, homelessness. The uh, uh, Warsaw City Office has introduced uh, uh, an interesting program based on Housing First, uh, where people in the unemployment, uh, the uh, homelessness crisis receive uh, access to a flat with the support of NGOs uh, and uh, social security workers, they learn to live in an apartment of their own. That's where we are educating these people. And education is a very important uh, element of uh, the uh, ending of pover uh, poverty and, and homelessness. We are explaining that uh, energy bills need to be as low as possible. They need to be lower. It's uh, about educating. It takes a long time time people in the crisis of uh, homelessness require special support when they are brought back to uh, independent living in society but what i wanted to tell you is that various groups are being looked after in a different way now about financial transfers when we reach uh, the moment of paying the bills for uh, uh, our uh, beneficiary the social worker when they take the bill they consider why the bill is so high and they go through this bill together with the client. Of course, that is done when uh, the uh, consumption of energy uh, seems uh, excessively high. It's also about education. It's not that the beneficiary uh, of social assistance uh, comes to us and we pay whatever bill is brought. We go through this bill, uh, we discuss why the bill is high, if it is, and all this uh, contributes to uh, raising awareness of uh, people. So social assistance centers are a useful way of re-educating people about uh, energy efficiency. In terms of uh, pure financial transfers, the Social Assistance Act provides uh, for a benefit for heating. Now, if we talk about uh, energy poverty uh, from this angle, we uh, spent 120 zlotys or uh, 30 euros uh, to this uh, uh, kind of uh, support. So you could say, you could claim that there is no energy poverty in the district of Bielane in Warsaw. Unfortunately, there are comments spoken without a microphone. I'm in touch with uh, directors of social uh, assistance centers from other 17 districts in Warsaw, but the, the costs uh, of uh, heating benefits have gone down to a negligible level. But if you talk about uh, rents, they uh, accounted to over 600,000 zlotys, and in the rents, you have central heating. You could say central heating, well, it's paid in the rent. Sometimes we pay the entire rent for our clients. Sometimes we just pay half, uh, depending on uh, the income level of our client. But again, the social assistance center and the system of beneficiary uses uh, income thresholds. Seven, seven, six, 
776 zlotis per person is the threshold in a single uh, person household. Is this enough to uh, pay for living costs? No. We are talking about poverty here. In terms of a member of a household, in line with the Act, it's 600 zlotis. We are not talking about any realistic sums of money. So support for paying uh, rent uh, with central heating is very relevant. Another thing is electricity and gas, and that's uh, an amount of over 400,000 zlotis uh, in the district of Bielany alone to help pay energy bills. But what the professor said, let me start by saying that uh, there is a conviction among uh, clients of social assistance centers, but I think it goes deeper, that we have to pay for uh, the apartment. We have to pay for electricity uh, because uh, it will be disconnected. That's the approach of our clients. Our clients, when they distribute their uh, resources, they tend to start by paying uh, their bills so that they do not fall behind in payments of uh, their bills, so that they are not evicted, so that gas or electricity is not disconnected. That's why further transfers from social assistance centers, you could say, goes uh, is spent on food and medicines. And this transfer last year in terms of uh, food was uh, valued one point at 1.5 million zlotis. Cost of uh, food, etc. And we take that into consideration. But it's often the case that the beneficiary, the client, comes to us with their bills at least partly paid. And they expect support with food. So when you're looking at the specificity of these payments being made, there's a lot of payments. But looking at uh, the uh, heating uh, benefit compared to other uh, benefits uh, with uh, which clients come to us, we he see this huge disproportion. In other words, we don't pay heating support because people it pay for it themselves. And after paying heating bills, electricity bills, gas bills, they come to us and need support elsewhere for food, medicines, etc. We uh, have also introduced uh, um, a new uh, way of uh, recording data uh, because we have also linked uh, the payments that we made to the general uh, ranking of the emission levels of buildings. We'll see what that kind of uh, data uh, tells us. Thank you very much uh, for discussing not just uh, the issue of financial transfers, but also the uh, huge role played in awareness raising and education. Now I'd like to go to the uh, city of Warsaw, Jacek Kisiel. You are in charge of replacing old uh, coal-powered furnaces. What is your take on contact with people in energy poverty? How do you face, uh, uh, how do you reach the people? What are the challenges that you encounter? Thank you very much. And Dean, when we are talking about uh, uh, fighting energy poverty, education is very important, and it's great that we heard about it. Social transfers, I'm not very good with that, but there's also a third way uh, of addressing energy poverty, that's boosting energy efficiency. If we're talking about energy uh, efficiency, here again, you have two types of actions, replacing the source of heat, and secondly, insulating the building. In terms of replace the replacement of the source of heat, we uh, heard that uh, very often energy poverty uh, affects uh, buildings which are not connected to central heating. And that's true. 
And I think uh, we need to uh, focus on district heating. It's uh, key in uh, the city. Uh, in Bielane, uh, you did not have any old uh, uh, coal-fired heating sources uh, when we were starting our program, and that was exceptional in uh, the city. So a big respect uh, to the district of Bielane. But it's good to mention one thing, the district heating is a way to tackle energy poverty. What happened in Poland after 1989, and I'm not talking about uh, Warsaw, I'm talking about all of Poland, the trend to privatize district heating, that was what happened. And now uh, heating companies, their logic of operation is focused on generating profits. And we have a big problem with that, because a heating company, if uh, they are to choose between uh, connecting to the district heating network a modern uh, estate with uh, uh, customers who are bound to pay, and they have an option of connecting uh, social housing where you never know whether you're going to get paid of course they're going to connect newly built buildings with affluent uh, residents so we as uh, local authorities uh, have a role to play here because we uh, follow uh, different uh, rules now looking from the perspective of tackling energy uh, poverty we as a city have lost an important part an important tool for fighting energy uh, poverty when we sold uh, the district heating uh, company Warsaw did have a program called district heating and we had a contract with uh, the energy company and uh, under this program we had a pool of buildings and the city could request connection to the district heating network that was a huge uh, maybe we're not talking about it enough but this was a huge success because we were connecting several dozen buildings uh, and per annum just to give you a number at the beginning of 2009 uh, in praga punas district just a handful of uh, social uh, uh, housing was connected uh, to uh, district heating. In 2019, it was 60%, and now it's even more. So a huge leap, a huge progress. And this had a uh, real impact on the um, uh, material situation of uh, people because people who are not connected to district heating have to heat themselves somehow using uh, coal, using gas, and that costs a lot of money. Then we got a lot of money uh, for fighting smog to address the problem of old uh, coal-fired uh, furnaces and or boilers. Okay, back online. Indeed, we reached uh, an agreement with the heating company that uh, with uh, buildings with old uh, coal uh, heated boilers, they agreed, Veolia uh, agreed to connect these buildings to central uh, heating, not focusing on economic costs. So uh, the city was able to eliminate uh, coal-fired boilers and furnaces, and uh, this meant that uh, dozens of households were connected to essential heating. Local authorities need to grow their central uh, district heating uh, networks. That's one of the key tools that we can apply to fighting energy poverty. There's another direction as well. And that's uh, improving the energy efficiency of buildings by losing uh, heat loss. It's not just uh, using styrofoam on the walls. Uh, it's about uh, replacing windows. It's about uh, insulating roofs. Ventilation is very important. 
uh, replacement uh, of uh, heaters, etc. So a lot needs to be done, and the city is facing a huge challenge in this respect, uh, also because of the strategic uh, documents, the green vision of Warsaw, which complies with EU directives. It uh, talks about uh, two, three percent uh, a thorough thermal modernization of buildings a year. This will be a huge challenge. We're getting ready for this already uh, in administrative terms. A great tool here is the uh, program supported by the European Investment Bank, uh, which is transferring money for energy audits to make sure that uh, any uh, overhauls are well designed so that the thermal modernization uh, is uh, as efficient as possible. There are funds. Uh, the BGK, the National Infrastructure Bank, uh, also has a great uh, uh, financing line for uh, local authorities. So the funds uh, will be available. That's what we think. On the side of local authorities, I think uh, we have three types of tools. Uh, it's important what we heard. We will not escape uh, financial transfers, social transfers. That's number one. Secondly, education, the work of uh, social workers, awareness raising, education. Uh, we have the Stop Smog uh, program. Uh, that is targeting uh, the poorest, more vulnerable uh, families. Uh, in the implementation of this program, we are working with uh, social uh, workers and with uh, energy advisors. Uh, even before the pandemic, we had a, a pilot in the district of Vavar. We identified there uh, many uh, households, uh, and we'll be trying to help uh, these people as part of the smog, uh, Stop Smog program. And uh, we're also carrying out a very interesting survey, the CARE project, which uh, seeks to identify uh, energy poverty in uh, social housing belonging to the municipality. We've been considering uh, for a very long time where we can find data on energy poverty in Warsaw. It's so complicated getting this data that uh, to simplify things, we decided that we need to focus uh, on uh, social uh, housing, that the buildings that belong to uh, the authorities, we can't find it anywhere else. So we're trying to identify uh, our uh, households in social uh, uh, housing, we will be uh, classifying, ranking our buildings according to their energy efficiency, the status of inhabitants. We would like to start with the buildings uh, where our intervention will be most efficient in terms of uh, tackling energy poverty. That's it from me. Thank you very much. I think uh, we can see that uh, the local authorities uh, are acting. You are taking advantage of whatever is available. Now I'd like us to switch to an international perspective. Thank you, uh, Basim, about the experience of Habitat for Humanity International, because Habitat for Humanity International has a number of projects that focus on um, improving energy efficiency of multi-apartment buildings and uh, also in relation to energy poverty. And I wanted to ask you about experience uh, from various countries uh, from our region, Central Eastern Europe. Uh, what are the major needs of the households you cooperated uh, with uh, within the framework of those projects? Uh, what was your experience uh, in cooperation with homeowner association? Could you share something about it? Sure. Well, first of all, glad to be here in Warsaw and at this panel today. I, I feel this is um, this is a very good. Uh, framing of of the issue and different uh, aspects of uh, you know yeah basically framing it it is an issue of uh, which is called energy poverty but this energy poverty is not a word which is widely understood by you know even by 
experts, let alone by average citizens. When you say food deprivation, that is a word that everybody understands, right? When you say energy poverty, it's a technical uh, word. So I feel we, we have a way to go with framing uh, the issue. So it becomes, because there was a conversation about, yeah, there is no awareness. Well, I mean, neither energy efficiency nor energy poverty are words in our daily vocabulary, right? And and I think we need to to work towards making it making them more of a word in in daily vocabulary because that's how the public sort of reacts to problems. Uh, I would call it, and the way it is, uh, you know, sort of by comparison to food poverty, it is the problem of the cold houses. Right? It is the inability to appropriately, appropriate to your income, heat, cool, cook, or have light in your apartment. But in our continent, it is mostly the problem of heating because that's that's the that's the largest bill. And it was said here by different panelists that um, you know it is a function of your income. So you know if you had very high income, you'll probably never be in a situation of energy poverty. Uh, it is a <clears throat> function of uh, the cost of the energy. And there you have obviously what types of fuel sources you use and what is the pricing uh, of that cost, how much control you have over, over consumption. Certain systems, district heating, um, there is metering in certain systems. There is not metering. What are the incentives? What is the social safety net beyond providing the heat? Is it sensitive to the fact that certain people can afford more and certain people can afford less? Uh, does the social services jump into this equation or it's left alone to the district heating? Uh, is there instruments that provide targeting it's difficult to find energy poor because it's not like the you know typical poor they don't overlap poverty and energy poverty don't overlap for the most part especially in winter months they may overlap in summer but uh, when it's when it's very difficult to heat certain families can spend up to 30 40 percent of their income on, on the energy bill and if they don't have it then they would have to decrease the temperature in the room uh, or live in a cold uh, apartment. Uh, so, so all of these are complex issues which require, first of all, uh, horizontal coordination between different policy disciplines, right? Between social support, energy, housing, yeah? because they tick all of these boxes. Usually in international conversations, this conversation starts with energy people. And I think they're the wrong people to address energy poverty because it's not really an energy problem. Uh, if energy was free, would it be a problem? Or if it was cheap, it wouldn't be a problem. It's, uh, you know, obviously now we are disregarding the climate aspect and the and the geopolitical ramifications of, of, of uh, you know, but from the social perspective, it is purely a problem. Uh, because of the cost of uh, energy and because of its unaffordability to uh, low-income and poor uh, people. Actually, in the 70s or before the 60s, when the stock was built, energy was very cheap. So obviously, we don't have historic data, but we wouldn't say that there was a, there was much of a, an issue. So going back to, the, to your question, but I thought we've done excellent work in framing it from this different... Uh, perspective and I think that's just the conversation that needs to happen on this uh, uh, a subject and sort of create a common ground because it's not it's a complex uh, uh, phenomena we as habitat are dealing with it uh, for the past 15 years not just in Central Europe also in the Western Balkans a little bit in the Caucasus because it's a very similar uh, issue and we are a housing organization so we obviously we said there are three three determinants of it uh, one is um, <clears throat> the uh, state of your building, right? So it makes a big difference if your building was built in 2012 with using, you know, and has thermal characteristics which are appropriate, or it was built in 1957 or 72, where it has, you know, it's probably a prefab. 
mass produced, fast produced, doesn't have thermal characteristics. And the time it was built, it was not important because energy was cheap or next to nothing or people didn't have to pay for it. So it was disregarded. And now it's 50 years old. So what we do is we try to create an ecosystem uh, in which homeowners, and this is bigger problem, it's obviously urban issue, not in the rural areas, though we work in the rural areas, uh, work together because they are now co-owners, right? Uh, and, and cooperate in order to, uh, yeah, access EU funding, access bank loans, that all exists in Poland too, in Slovakia, in, in Czech Republic. Uh, but, you know, we use Slovakia as an example. Slovakia has is probably the leader in this. They've refurbished around 60% of the buildings. So 40 are not refurbished. And it's usually yeah, the, the more affluent uh, 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 part of the building stock. So we have a systemic problem uh, here. And, uh, you know, without disregarding the income parts and some of the colleagues talk about the income parts and the, and the fuel sources and the cost of fuel, I think we must uh, uh, create faster and easier mass renovation of uh, uh, residential buildings. Uh, unfortunately, they are the least renovated, even if you look at, at all the statistics, especially the multi-apartment building stock. They are com compared to industry and public buildings. They are the least renovated. In certain countries, they are the, uh, the housing sector contributes by 30 to 40 percent, maybe not in Poland, I don't have the statistics, uh, in both the um, uh, energy consumption and the CO2 uh, measured by, by uh, uh, tons of CO2 emitted by the household sector or by the residential sector. So, so basically, <clears throat> creating that uh, <clears throat> ecosystem in which uh, homeowners are at the center of it remains a bit problematic because they're all macro level planning. Yeah, So we're talking about systemic challenges, but you know, somebody has to take that loan or apply for the, for the uh, uh, subsidy or combine the subsidy with the loan and then organize the works. And this is all uh, uh, maintains a challenge, obviously, in, in more affluent parts of the city that happens purely because there's an economic incentives. There are high value apartments. People who live in them are uh, better off. They have uh, the means. They also probably know procedures. Some of them may even work in banks or have, uh, have access to, to state institutions which provide subsidies. So it's very easy for them to do that. But uh, if you go further into the, you know, down in the social, uh, 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 in the social uh, classification, then you would see that it becomes uh, the number of those buildings is less and less uh, in terms of uh, uh, rate of renovation. Uh, yeah, obviously there is no uh, awareness on the benefits of energy efficiency, but this is again a topic that we don't talk over in the table, right? I mean, when we have dinner, say, hey, let's do some energy efficiency. That doesn't come. Uh, across, you know, we we usually as families, as households, we don't manage efficiencies like in a board of directors of a company. Uh, what we do is we, you know, if we can afford it, it's not a problem, right? If we cannot afford it, we cut on consumption, right? We say, okay, last month's bill was too high, so we have to be a little bit more careful about our behavior and and our uh, consumption next month. Uh, maybe change a switch. But it doesn't really come through as, okay, let's start and work with our neighbors, go to the bank, hire, uh, apply for a loan and work, you know, work out the what are what are the state subsidies that we can use. And sort of this is sort of what Habitat tries to, to spark in specific uh, places. And we have a number of regional uh, projects and activities of uh, uh, obviously creating one-stop shops, which facilitate this process, attached to municipality. City is the best. Uh, source of uh, support and um, well basically it's a social service if the city or the municipality has social services why shouldn't it help uh, citizens uh, or create put this in the portfolio of its services to enable 
uh, renovation of uh, of apartments because it's such an important uh, for for the city for the income and it was said by the the previous uh, colleagues here in the in the panel it does make uh, it does make sense it just doesn't happen by itself it's not one of those things that will self spark or self initiate uh because it's complex in many different ways which were also said here so 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 the case is that it becomes part of the portfolio of 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 services that is attached Either to the municipality or to the to the government or through a a, a public par a private partnership because um, you know the 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 time is right to do that and uh, and I think it would go a long way and there is body of evidence actually we this is what we do in many of these projects we are trying to 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 attach those resource centers or one stop shops which provide facilitation uh, to buildings and to homeowner associations, and then have the municipality adopt it as part of its regular portfolio, because uh, it just creates a big difference in the rate of renovation, in energy saved, in energy poverty addressed, in CO2 saved, uh, pre and after. I, I would, um, I think I'm past my time of five minutes, so I'm looking forward to the, to the conversation further. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Basim. I dziękuję bardzo za to, że wspomniałeś o... Thank you, Basim, and thank you for mentioning knowledge. Because we are talking about energy poverty, um, we are very much interested in this phenomenon. But how does it look like um, among common bread eaters, among ordinary people? I think um, I should give the floor to Maria. Um, who has taken part in 40 local discussions on uh, energy efficiency. She organized um, um, a civic panel. It's Poland in a nutshell. Um, she was talking to Poles from very different walks of life, living in very different parts in po of Poland. So um, people who were discussing energy um, efficiency with you, have you noticed their transformations? What are your insights after this process? Well, thank you very much for inviting the Shipyard Foundation um, to this panel. Uh, we are going to discuss energy poverty. Um, we are not an expert in this area. We are specializing in inclusion of citizens citizens in discussions dedicated to major issues and two years ago energy um poverty appeared on our radar as an important issue which is um, affecting 10 percent of households in poland and just a comment regarding this video it was um shot um before the beginning of the war in ukraine in early 2020 so um the institute for structural research confirms um that it's not 1.3 million households um, affected by energy um, poverty, but 1.5 million households. So um, the number went up um, significantly. And last year, um, we were discussing energy poverty with 700 um, Poles from all over Poland during regional meetings. And 100 additional interviewees um, who took part in the civic panel. And um, this project would not be successful if it did not include education. Um, it's something that has not been researched by experts. It seems that in our country, on the central and local level, and also on the EU level, um, we are only defining, we are only beginning to diagnose. 
um, what energy poverty is. And what we've noticed um, in the first place, when we were encouraging people to organize um, local meetings in Poland and also to take part um, in this meeting to discuss um, energy poverty and potential solutions, we have noticed that what is a major challenge is to find experts, local experts, and if local government units were organizing the meeting, it was also very difficult to evaluate the sheer scale of the problem um, at a given location. We knew that energy poverty would be um, difficult to explain because it's poverty that we are usually discussing, um, poverty as such, and um, energy poverty um, in Poland um, is a very distinctive issue, which is why we have decided to um, build a database on our website. We, we provide different tools that facilitate work while meetings lasted. And to our great satisfaction, people who were attending local meetings and our panel, well, they knew roughly what we are going to discuss, but um, as they were leaving the meeting, um, do you used to comment, um, I knew something about this issue, but I had no idea that it's so widespread. I had no idea that it's such a complex topic. I had, um, it never dawned on me um, um, what approach you can take to have this issue solved. We were trying to um, indicate um, several options and um, encourage people to think, what can I do as a user, as a citizen, as a resident to have the problem fixed? We were also indicating solutions um, that could um, be viable for local government units or, um, or could be implemented on the national level and should be stressed. Um, those meetings we were holding um, and the panel uh, were joined not only by um, citizens, but also experts, um, representatives of local government units and activists. Um, because um, energy poverty translates into other trends addressed by activists. So in addition to education, an important part of the meeting um, was to make um, each other sensitive um, to situation of people affected by energy poverty. Our meetings were attended by people who defined themselves because there was a questionnaire survey that they were filling in after the meeting, asked people who were affected by that, but of course not everyone. And I think, um, say for education, one of the major um, results of those meetings is um, it opened our eyes to what other people are struggling with and citizens realized what challenges what difficulties are faced by local government units plus experts um i think that's important they are sitting with us today people who contributed to our meetings and i think it's right to say um what is confirmed by our reports and you can read that our experts realize that people are able to um, learn a lot, they're hungry for knowledge, and um, with the right knowledge about the complexity of the problem, our respondents could generate many new ideas. They had um, sensible insights. Um, 
and um, their ideas are instantly to put to a test. So you have the right mindset, even though you're not an expert and you don't have to be an expert. So I think it was a valuable exercise for everyone involved. Let me just quote um, one figure after the panel. 71% of uh, panelists admitted that sometimes they did change their mind um, and opinion um, while discussing um, energy poverty and solutions. So this is the best evidence that people were coming in with very different level of knowledge. And because we have created sound conditions for a discussion based on knowledge um, with experts present, and it may um, strongly impact people um, who have um, their own preconceptions. Um, and they become flexible in the process. And they decide to open up to change and um, they change their mindset. So education is one of the elements that we are focused on. Many of our panelists said that this was an exceptional experience where they felt as if they were attending a very special university, that they are absorbing uh, knowledge, that these experts are there for them. They go to their households and they talk to uh, their families, uh, their friends, people at work, and uh, they cascade this knowledge uh, to the other people. Some of them uh, asked that we prepare a presentation from the two days, and we can go uh, to our homes, to mayors, uh, and talk and show what we have learned here. These are very important things. One lady said that this is knowledge that should be uh, widely available, and we should be learning about it all in secondary school because these topics are complex and we're not even aware how many different uh, elements produce or result in a significant uh, problem of poverty. And suddenly it turns out that uh, the topic is much broader, much deeper. And finally, let me say that one of our panelists, because we had uh, people coming with all sorts of concerns, and this was also uh, linked to the fact that they don't feel they are experts in many things. And one of the panelists said that uh, it turns out that we're not that stupid. That we can understand things. We can draw our conclusions. We can advise people. And they were saying that uh, you have to work with uh, the public. It's not that the government or local government have the best solutions out there. The silver bullets for all problems. No, uh, in the process, they felt they were learning so much that uh, their contribution was also valuable. And I think that's a full stop from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. We went back uh, to this uh, civic panel. I think it was very useful for the panelists, but also for the organizations involved and the experts who were in uh, this process. We ourselves, if I uh, can say that, uh, we were inspired by this uh, process. And we started... Uh, trying to get social organizations uh, on board, so the organizations that work with uh, the poorest citizens. It turned out that these organizations are afraid of energy and climate issues. They are working very hard in their daily work. For them, it was too complicated, too technical, and they were not, or they were reluctant to uh, 
participate in the discussion of documents that shape the uh, energy and climate policy of the state. And when we started uh, uh, addressing this issue, it turns out that social uh, organizations don't need very thorough uh, awareness of uh, climate and energy issues, but they do know uh, the expectations, the needs of vulnerable groups, and they are a bridge uh, towards uh, supporting uh, people in energy poverty. That's a comment. Now, to the systemic level that uh, was there in the background, you cannot escape it. I'd like to pass uh, the floor uh, to uh, Alicia. Uh, this will be an introduction to the survey that you carried out as the Polish Green Network. You are a researcher interested in social and energy related uh, things. So, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, for this opportunity to carry out the survey. As I'm speaking last in this round, I would like to refer to everything that we've heard so far. Before I proceed to explaining what uh, green and social issues, the mixture, the blending of these things is about, I'd like to say that poverty, energy poverty is an interdisciplinary uh, uh, trend. That's why it's very difficult to capture because data is often available, but standardizing it, uh, uh, talking to people, is a process that is uh, laborious and difficult. At national level and local level, uh, it uh, needs a lot of effort. Now, moving uh, to uh, the question, I'm happy, uh, Ola, that you mentioned this initiative of uh, bridging the gap between social uh, workers, social NGOs, and climate and energy uh, experts. Well, the topic of green, uh, green economy in general is about being net zero at the level of the EU and individual member states. But Originally, at first, there was strong emphasis on technical issues, which are key for the process, but only uh, recently have we started to, to talk about the fact that this needs to be a social uh, process, that has to be a social dimension to climate. And that's what we're trying to implement in practice. The inclusion of social organizations is one aspect of uh, what we're doing. And it's gaining prominence uh, when we are talking about energy uh, poverty. It's about education, reaching people, knowledge, knowing the people. And here, social workers are key, and various NGOs are key, the priceless. It's impossible to develop. Uh, a comprehensive policy if you don't know the target group. That's key. Often people in all sorts of crises, they are in survival mode. So we are aware that for them, climate and energy issues are not their priority. They don't understand what we're talking about, but it's important to make it a priority. This is nothing original, but to improve living standards, they have to be aware of energy and climate. The way that you behave at home really matters for our social functions, for our health. And we already heard all about it uh, in the panel. So that's a conclusion. With regard to the results uh, of our survey, we had some assumptions that we started with, we formulated some hypotheses, and it uh, did prove true that uh, there is a need to work together, both in terms of uh, energy poverty and the housing policy in general. 
we have all sorts of solutions available. We all know, and uh, this will feature in our presentation, the Rybnik uh, initiative, uh, Eco Housing. And it's all very cool, but it's still new. And basically, these solutions need to be scalable. Also, uh, social rental agencies, that's an initiative uh, that uh, will probably work in the future. It's a very positive development for the future. That's what our survey uh, proved. But we need to make sure that there is this snowball effect. And we need to uh, be able to uh, work with the results from the first days. So the combination of green issues and social issues uh, uh, is also uh, in uh, the civic uh, energy generation. This is something that is gaining momentum. There are financial uh, uh, tools uh, to uh, support this, but for that you need public trust. And that's very difficult because the energy transition as such, for it to be successful, uh, we need to be uh, sensitive to the needs of the public and we need to look at the energy transition from the point of view of individuals within a system. I think in all the interviews that we ha uh, held, uh, that's the key message. Also in terms of challenges, there are no internal challenges. This is not a problem of people. It's a problem of the system as such, and that's well, I'll finish and we'll uh, go on talking about it later. Thank you very much, Alicia. I'm not going to comment. I will pass the floor to Dr. Justyna Orłowska, the second researcher from the Polish Green Network. She will present the results of the survey that we keep talking about. Justyna Orłowska, the Polish Green Network, and we start the presentation. In the meantime, I'd like to refer to the video that we saw at the beginning and to what you were saying. We know that energy poverty is a very complex uh, phenomenon. It's very difficult to research it. And I'd like to add a layer of difficulty. It's going to get even more difficult because in this conversation, uh, we not had uh, about the fact that it's not just about heating homes, it's also about cooling homes. And that ties into what uh, you have been uh, uh, talking about, the fact that it's going beyond the groups that were traditionally uh, threatened with uh, poverty. I can give you my own example. I'm, I live uh, on the top floor of an old tenement house. Uh, we have uh, pretty good insulation, but this uh, summer was uh, really uh, difficult. Uh, I have small kids. Uh, it's October and uh, in our home, it's 27 degrees. And I'm one of the people who have stable income, but I'm thinking about uh, uh, fitting uh, an air conditioner next year, and that costs a lot of money. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to fund it, and I don't even uh, want to think about paying for uh, the costs of running this installation. But it was really difficult this year already, and the climate is heating up, so it's going to be even more difficult. So climate change is something that presents us with the new challenges, and it complicates something that is already very complicated. But it's good that we're talking about it here. Now, what do I do? to start the presentation. This is the first slide, right? This is the official name of this uh, study. Uh, you don't really see it, uh, the panelists. The name is pretty complicated. How to effectively address the problem of energy uh, poverty 
potential of uh, housing policy and social policy instruments with particular uh, role of uh, the social rental agencies. A very clear message here about the directions. Uh, this is a statement by uh, Franz Timmermans, who left the European Commission in August, and he left saying, I beg you, don't uh, believe that there is uh, a contradiction between climate uh, justice and social justice. Without climate uh, policy, social justice is an illusion. Without social justice, climate policy will never gain wide support. It's very important to look at climate policy as something that will get cheaper. It's the only option. It's the only way forward. Also in the area that we are discussing today. The objective of our study was to explore topics such as the awareness and understanding of uh, social rental agencies. The Polish acronym is SAN, S -A -N. the assessment uh, of uh, selected instruments of housing and social policy in the context of challenges, that is uh, energy poverty, we were checking the biggest concerns, the biggest pains, and we were also uh, trying to establish what works. What are the links between climate policy and housing policy in a more social dimension? The clicker doesn't seem to work. Now the methodology. We carried out this uh, study in the summer. This was not the most fortunate time, but to defend uh, what we did, this was uh, about exploration, about quality. We had uh, 12 interviews with representatives of different organizations, uh, social uh, security centers, local governments, NGOs, uh, and ministries. It's uh, impossible to build a representative group, but uh, certain topics kept coming up again and again, and they featured in all our interviews. So you could say that these topics are shared, they are important, and this is a suggestion what you can further explore, which topics are very relevant. The interviews were carried out uh, by phone or on Zoom in uh, July and August 2023, so very recent results. Um, um, the um, knowledge of social rental agencies that was um, interesting interviews indicate um, this is something we've heard today that it rings a bell, but um, no one had any um, tangible contacts with such agencies in real life. Um, the term is familiar, but it has not been internalized. It's not something everyone is using on a wide scale. But our interviewees um, have decided that it's, um, you know, it sounds very promising. I don't know if you're familiar with social rental agencies. I know everyone from Habitat um, knows very well what it is. But, um, you know, for me, this was a brand new concept as well. A social rental um, agencies are um, agencies um, that act as intermediaries between people who want to rent out their own private home, um, let it be a house or an apartment, um, at a lower price. So um, they are lowering the rent. It's a bit lower than um, market rates, but you have safety and security. 
as a landlord. Okay, so rental via um, um, social rental agencies, do you also do property management, handle maintenance and repairs? So um, the landlord doesn't have to worry about it for the next two decades, for example. Not for the next two decades, but yes, you don't have to worry about it. Um, that's the point, you know, you are offering a lower price, lower than the market rate, and um, you are not managing the property. And um, our um, tenants are usually people um, who are struggling. So if they cannot pay the rent in a given month, um, the landlord um, doesn't have to worry about that because the rent will be paid by the NGC. So this is something that is a part of the system, which is why um, um, it's safe. So it offers um, security for landlords. Um, but there were voices that there are um, no workshops, there are no examples, perhaps someone is already doing it and could share experiences, so they've heard about it. And many municipalities um, have no courage to implement it in real life. Um, assessment of housing policy instruments. As it transpires, uh, we've heard from many people that the market is not very receptive to pro-social solutions that would enable um, clients to, um, I'm speaking to welfare language, um, to start a new leave. Um, Okay, so the new, uh, turning a new leave, um, we were talking to different people and um, there were examples of um, people who are becoming independent because um, before that they were in foster families. So it's socialization of people um, who are in non-standard living situations or social situations. And yesterday during our session, we've heard that the market is becoming more and more social oriented. But, um, you know, what prevails on the market is, you know, everyone should have his own home or apartment and it's best to build your own house, um, especially in rural areas. Um, houses are inhabited by um, senior citizens who are living on their own. They are underheated. And it's very difficult to tell people, you know, move out of your home because it's better for you. We have a thing in Poland, you don't replant old trees. And there is not um, a solution available that could be implemented and new homes are being built because um, young people want to live in their own homes. So, um, you know, just to give you more context. Um, yes, we were conducting interviews and we've noticed that many people believe that there is no common denominator, there is no link between different institutions, different ministries, um, that we are not combining um, um, activities, uh, we are not, there is no link between um, different initiatives, so um, they believe um, that initiatives should be more systemic. What they see as success of the housing policy is uh, support granted to municipalities. And um, very often things look great on paper um, and it doesn't really translate into reality. The biggest challenge is um, interviews are an opportunity to complain a bit, um, at least for interviewees, and that's the point, because we are also interested to hear about pains, uh, things that are um, most problematic for our interviewees. Um, and what I found um, interesting, um, um, 
very often people perceive climate friendly solutions as economic and future oriented. Very different people we were talking to, including activists and representatives of municipalities. For example, they said, it doesn't give me satisfaction if I know that a solution will be short lived. And they know that in order to have long term results, you need to have an initial investments to see results in a 10 years time in two decades and they understand that at the end of the day it's much more economic so they expect future proof solutions what is very positive um in their daily work they don't have really time to um, read about current developments and they would like to have a better insight, they would like to have better knowledge, they would like to um, read about the findings of um, scientific studies, but they simply have no time for that. Um, many people stated something that Alicia has mentioned, um, that um, there are no programs geared for specific groups. The number of programs is growing, what is great, and more and more groups are taken care of, but not all of them. Especially people with disabilities have not been um, offered specific solutions. There is a problem with um, funding and um, durability of projects. Um, so we are implementing a project. There is um, funding allocated to the project. Ministries were complaining about it. And later, there is no follow up. So um, when a program is implemented, um, it looks like a pilot. And there are no training courses. There are no additional solutions to ensure actual implementation of the program. So everything ends with the pilot, which shouldn't be a pilot after all. And many people complain that uh, legislation is amended time and time again, that they are not able to keep up with legal amendments. They are reading an act and some provisions which were there last month are gone. And no effective information flow between different departments, between different um, units and institutions. So this um, cross-disciplinary nature exists on paper and not in real life. Um, there are many promising uh, solutions introduced um, by different municipality. Um, this is the local welfare center in Nova, uh, a passive home that was built um, to uh, provide a comfortable warm space for local residents. And something that you probably know, you probably heard about it. Um, Co-housing. Um, the municipality helps senior citizens who are living alone to sell flats or homes. And um, they it renovates, um, it refurbishes an apartment so senior citizens can live together. Um, for me, um, as a social researcher, it's a fantastic solution because it also prevents loneliness against the elderly people. Of course, um, um, you need to match personalities of those senior citizens, what well, is not easy. But um, it is a quick fix to a number of issues. Okay, and I would add a very Polish example, because the social segment, um, well, the pay you get is not even decent, and there are many people who are committed and very dedicated, who are um, mission-driven, um, and they introduce um, many solutions which bypass the system, um, um, 
which are very innovative, very creative, um, um, because they actually want to have problems fixed and the system actually prevents them from doing that. And um, conclusions, interviewees definitely see the need for long-term systemic solutions. For example, coal subsidies, um, they were laughing at it. They ridiculed it. They argued it wasn't spent on coal. Um, it served a very different purpose. Um, and it wasn't um, highly rated. What was appreciated were uh, future-proof solutions. What they need is better coordination between different institutions and better communication. And they also need um, new solutions. In, if something has been tried and tested, if something works elsewhere, other municipalities should be informed about it. So what is needed is this networking and workshops to share best practices. Um, they also want to invest in higher housing standards, in more energy efficient technologies, especially for most vulnerable groups. Thank you. Justina, thank you very much. Um, to recap, um, um, findings from the study will be published in the report on um, the housing market in 2023. We'll be recapping findings from our study. We have very little time left, but um, we need to address uh, systemic solutions um, introduced by um, the Polish Green Network. If you could briefly comment on it, you have two minutes. I do realize it's very little time, but just to give an outline of challenges related to state institutions, to the systems, the moment in time we are in. So let's start with the European level of Habitat uh, for Humanity International, if you could uh, um, describe the situation uh, on the European level. Uh, we have ambitious climate goals and uh, we have also uh, legal solutions uh, related to that. So if you could paint a picture in what moment uh, are we now? Two minutes if you manage. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, to bardzo krótko. Na poziomie unijnym dyrektywa o wydajności energetycznej um, tak naprawdę przedstawia pierwszą unijną do, definicję ubóstwa energetycznego, co jest bardzo pozytywne. Natomiast unijna dyrektywa o wydajności energetycznej budynków kładzie nacisk na um, wsparcie, um, ułatwienia społeczne, które muszą zostać wzmocnione. Um, dyrektywa wymaga, żeby wszystkie kraje członkowskie um, składały plany modernizacji budynków i um, tutaj głównym czynnikiem jest walka z uh, ubóstwem energetycznym. Natomiast uh, fundusz... Uh, Społeczny Fundusz Klimatyczny także kładzie nacisk na modernizację. Tak wyglądają ogólne ramy. Natomiast kilka zastrzeżeń na poziomie unijnym. Nie ma dużej świadomości, dlatego że to jest Europa Zachodnia, która skupia się na krajach Europy Zachodniej, a, a bardzo często um, ten problem dotyka właścicieli mieszkań i domów. Um, e, często myślimy błędnie, że właściciel mieszkania nie jest osobą ubogą. Um, w Danii tak jest, ale w Polsce już nie. Właściciele mieszkań często mieszkają w niedogrzanych mieszkaniach, bo ich nie stać. Druga kwestia. Należy e, wszystko przełożyć na poziom lokalny. 
także um, jako uh, twórcy polityki, a um, promotorzy tej polityki, wszystko oczywiście zależy, jak to przyswoimy na rynku lokalnym. No, zmieści zmieściłem się w dwóch minutach. Dziękuję, Pasim. Podsumować politykę unijną. It would it was very difficult to recap the EU policy in two minutes, but let's go back to Poland. A question to Maria. Um, in the context of the past year, after um, the civic panel dedicated to the cost of energy, do you see um, any activities um, undertaken to solve the issue of energy poverty, do they reflect um, the diagnosis of the civic panel? Are we on the right track? Are we trying? Tak. There were 120 uh, points in our verdict. We were trying to structure these uh, comments and we found that the biggest expectations of people were linked to a uh, very clear, stable, long-term strategy, something that would not change every now and then. Even citizens uh, find it difficult to make rational decisions about their investments, not to mention bigger uh, projects uh, involving uh, local authorities, for example. The law doesn't make it easier for people to work together. So that's an expectation vis-a-vis uh, -vis our legislation. I'm not tracking the situation that closely, but I think uh, this point and the modernization and expansion of the uh, district uh, heating uh, network, uh, giving energy to the people, improving energy efficiency of houses, modification of programs uh, that currently exist at the National uh, Environmental Protection Fund offers and other uh, programs. Uh, things are happening. The EU policies and the expectations vis-a-vis uh, -vis national and local plans, it all forces all of us particularly the decision makers, to respond to the challenges and to the findings of our verdict. To the extent possible, uh, there is a lot of interest, uh, the, there is a lot of uh, information that we gathered uh, from the panel. We had 100 people discussing uh, these issues in the panel. Perhaps uh, their comments uh, are being heard and considered. There's a lot happening. Uh, I'm sure that we need to uh, have to we, we need to continue educating people. Uh, I don't think it. Uh, we're doing enough. The plans are very ambitious. EU level plans, national plans, uh, going down to local plans. But climate change will affect all of us. We can not afford to leave anyone behind. Even if someone is left behind, we need to uh, make sure that at least these people are aware of what's happening. There are very uh, many difficult decisions that will affect all of us, but sometimes education and bigger awareness of people uh, means that they are able to uh, accept uh, concessions that have to be made for the common good. The common good, which may be distant, uh, changes will not take place uh, overnight. And we will have to uh, grit our teeth and uh, try to hold on. And that's key uh, to address the problem of climate change uh, in an evolutionary rather than revolutionary way, so that we make sure that uh, well, people have to understand that it's important for them. And I don't think we are 
talking enough about uh, the need for changes, why the changes are being introduced, that investments are needed, that investments uh, will make uh, electricity cheaper, that investments uh, will uh, generate jobs. I don't think people get enough explanations. And finally, from our perspective, we feel that decision makers have missed the process somewhat. They attended the summary, the closing remarks, but we've been trying, like most of you present, we were trying to uh, take advantage of the electoral campaign to promote the findings of the verdict and the tool that uh, enabled us to uh, talk to the citizens. Uh, things did happen. Some uh, parties uh, were interested. Uh, some others were not interested at all. So we're feeling some satisfaction, but I don't think I don't think uh, it's enough. Nevertheless, uh, we are convinced that things are going to move in the right direction. Our process uh, resulted in some expert organizations establishing some common areas which can uh, boost uh, the messages. There are working groups being established, uh, not only thanks to the panel, but perhaps we have made a step in the right direction. Now, a question to the representatives of uh, the local authorities. From the point of view of your institutions, you have to abide by the decisions or lack of decisions of decision makers at national level. We heard about uh, legislative changes, lack of communication, lack of awareness. So a question to you, Agnieszka and Jacek. I will not talk about uh, the technical side of things. I'm afraid that there may be a conflict between the general public and the people in charge of climate policy. Because we have to frankly admit that we live in a country which is based on fossil fuels. And climate policy is... Uh, getting to the public, they're paying for it. A survey carried out recently uh, of, uh, it's, it's about uh, a survey for the young people who are only uh, getting their electoral uh, crisis. And for them, climate crisis is not important. People who are around 18 years of uh, age, for them what matters are the costs of living. And I'm afraid that we are on a collision course uh, and that the uh, climate policy may be a stick against the actions of uh, governments and local governments. Uh, the quote from Franz Timmermans was very important. If climate policy fails to have the social dimension, there will be no climate policy. And energy poverty, dealing with energy, po uh, energy poverty, can be a bridge between effective climate policy and social support. Without social support, uh, we can just get locked in our bubble. Because we, at local government level, we are dependent on uh, public support. Without it, we cannot imagine going on. So we need public support for smart climate policy. I'm afraid. I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, of the fact that at the moment we have the regulators uh, uh, taking stance, we have uh, lower VAT, we have uh, social transfers, but have we diagnosed energy poverty in Poland, if we have the tools that are available, 
that regulate the prices of energy. Where are we in this process? Transfers that are being made in relation to this area will run out. When we're talking about uh, people in poverty, uh, which uh, are on less than a thousand zlotys per person, they uh, will uh, also be people who are uh, in energy poverty. We're living in a bubble. We are not talking about uh, transfers uh, in our daily uh, lives. Uh, we are not seeing the uh, actual costs. That's what uh, concerns me. So diagnosis is one thing. Secondly, we need to adjust as soon as possible the Polish legislation to the EU legislation. There's no time to waste. We cannot sit and think whether we want to adjust or we don't. It's high time that we start working on the uh, basis of uh, the directives uh, that are in force already. We need a global legislative framework, but we need to adjust our local strategies. So we need to adjust our national legislation and we need to have targeted uh, strategies uh, for specific locations, for specific areas. We in Warsaw are facing different problems than people from uh, Lower Silesia or other regions of Poland. They have different concerns, they have different problems. We need to fine tune the global legislation so that every local authority could build new strategies without uh, fearing legislative changes. When they build strategies, they will be able to address energy poverty at local level. Thank you very much for this uh, perspective. Now over to the professor, as uh, someone who is observing the system. You have written many expert uh, studies. If you could comment on national level solutions. There will be a new government. Uh, they will be able to uh, streamline public policies. Do you see any solutions? Well, uh, we don't know whether the new government will be the old government or the really new government. If it's the old government, well, I don't know if uh, anything is going to change uh, in this respect. And the old government, I would say, was uh, sensitive to social problems uh, related uh, to the rising uh, energy costs. The legislative changes that I already mentioned, the introduction of a definition of energy poverty in the Social Assistance uh, Act. The act does not define poverty itself, but are they really addressing uh, energy? But in the energy law, there is a literal definition of energy poverty. So for me, that was a great breakthrough. But where did it come from? Uh, there were many institutions uh, talking about it. Uh, there were EU initiatives, EU legislation that influenced the matters. And then there was pressure from the problem, uh, rising prices, and you need to do something to address problems, uh, to make sure that uh, voters are favorable. And they introduced not just the new definition uh, of energy poverty, but they also introduced uh, support programs where private energy companies uh, who are selling energy had to organize support programs for uh, vulnerable uh, uh, customers who have uh, difficulties paying for energy. We recently asked uh, prisons whether they have uh, social workers, uh, but they do not have any social workers in prisons. 
even though the Social uh, Assistance Act uh, enabled them to do that. Then in the private companies, uh, I think uh, they we will have to ask the private energy companies whether they have employed any social workers for uh, to, to run these uh, programs of support. So things are happening in the system, and uh, we will be able to refer to that uh, in the coming years. The old government would probably continue uh, on this uh, trajectory. If there is a really new government, then uh, what you mentioned from Bielane, uh, we can release uh, the prices and there will be a, a, a surge in prices and the EU is going to say, but we have an excessive deficit procedure because you've been not uh, looking after uh, public finance we will be in a very difficult situation. But the new government could blame the old government for uh, being the reason behind uh, all that. And austerity will be blamed on the previous government. And they will be blamed on the EU, perhaps. In this condition, will it be possible to address the issue of energy poverty? There will certainly be a need for, for some assistance because th the prices are going to surge and maybe uh, at the next elections will be further along the road. But things may also take a different turn where the inflation uh, drops and the problem of price will be uh, less persistent and then politicians might be more favorable to uh, look at addressing the issue of energy poverty. Well, we, we don't know what's going to happen in other words. Thank you very much. Alizio, if you could uh, take the floor, not just from the point of view of a researcher, but also the member of the committee monitoring uh, social funds for social development. What is your take on the system, the prospects of the system? Now, very briefly, Right now, we have an unprecedented situation where the money is there, the will theoretically is there, but the question is how? And the how will depend on how institutions perceive uh, each other. Right now, uh, there is a review uh, of the National Plan for Energy and Climate this is an important strategic document that lays down the key directions of the energy and climate policy of the country. And we're trying to make sure that energy poverty is mentioned in this document so that it is part of the strategy. Also the, also the uh, social climate fund. This can not be created independently. It has to be connected. We have to see these things. If we fail to do that, we will not get anywhere. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, exceeding the time. And I'd like to encourage you so that in your daily work, you continue monitoring uh, the developments and uh, to look at the social dimension of uh, climate and energy policy. Also, please monitor the uh, review of the National Energy and Climate uh, Plan. Then we're going to continue working on the implementing document, the social, um, social Climate Fund. Poland will get 18% of the Social Climate Fund. This is a huge amount of money. So we have to monitor what's uh, happening. We don't have uh, time for Q&A, so please approach our panelists during the coffee break. Thank you very much for coming, and I feel this is not the last discussion. We've only just started addressing this topic. Thank you very much.